welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Arnold Iser. He is an internal medicine physician and he's the author of the book, Preserving Brain Health in a Toxic Age, New Insights from Neuroscience, Integrative Medicine, and Public Health. Arnold, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good to be here. So we'll get into your book in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. It's a, it's a bit of a convoluted one. I, I was in the first half of my career, I was an academic nephrologist for the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Then mid-career, I switched to running academic general internal medicine divisions and was chief of general medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I also was involved in health services research and bioethics research. I then moved back east to the Philadelphia area to run uh, graduate medical education programs and for both the Mercy Health System and Drexel University College of Medicine. Towards the end of that time, I wrote a first book called The Ethos of Medicine in Postmodern America. And when I retired from that, I looked around to write another book. I started writing a book on diseases increasing in the 21st century, but the publishing world said that's too broad and asked me to narrow it. They wanted me to focus on one disease. I declined to do that and I focused on neurodegenerative diseases and the effect of environmental pollutants in increasing their prevalence. All right. So tell me more about, about that topic in terms of how you got interested in that and eventually that led to led to a book. Tell me about that story. Well, I, I, around the same time, I was also began writing scholarly articles in the area of neuroscience, starting with a, a book on why Finland has the, such a high rate of dementia death. And it, I identified four factors in the environment, methylmercury, in the, in the fish that gets consumed there, a moldy, uh, toxic environment in, the, in their homes. Helsinki has one of the most humid, as well as cold capitals in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it, it leads to the promotion of mold growth. And, and then the additional factor was there is a lot of a neurotoxin produced by cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. Mm -hmm. in the Baltic Sea, and that BMAA can be associated not only with development of dementia, but also other neurodegenerative disorders. And a fourth factor was uh, a deficiency of selenium in the soil in Finland. All right, and that topic certainly has broadened into this book that we're going to talk about, Preserving Brain Health in a Toxic Age. New insights from neuroscience, integrative medicine, and public health. Now, what are some of the key messages that you want your readers to come away with after reading? I think uh, for the physician readers, I, I want them to pay attention to the fact that so many diseases are related to environmental toxins. To the, to the non-clinician readers, I want them to understand there are ways that they can protect themselves from environmental toxins. And that includes us learning to recognize where environmental toxins are likely to occur, such as blue-green algae, which can occur on recreational waterways and should be avoided. So let's go into more detail. I'm a primary care physician. What are some common diseases I may see in the exam room that are associated with environmental toxins? Well, the two uh, diseases I focused primarily on were Alzheimer's uh, dementia, Alzheimer's autism spectrum disorder. The latter in particular are increasing at an astonishing rate in, in the 21st century. And it's clearly has an association with an increase in the environmental toxins in our environment. So it is important to learn what are those toxins, how they can be avoided, I mean, as recently as a couple months ago, there were reports of metal toxins in baby food. That should be, that should not happen because 
they're significantly susceptible to any kind of toxin, but metal toxins are one of the most serious toxins that, are, that can uh, damage the neurological development of an infant. But I, don't, I, I describe other issues as well, uh, disorders that have sometimes been called uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis, also appears to be related to environmental toxins as well. The, uh, the other thing is, uh, at, at, in writing the book, I had an uh, opportunity to interview many physicians who are involved in the treatment of environmental illnesses. And they often identify now as integrative medicine physicians, but they didn't start out that way. So I asked them, how, how did you end up making that switch? And with the, one exception, they said they got an environmental illness and they needed to go to an integrative physician in order to get treated, <clears throat> which to me was kind of astonishing. We thought as an allopathic a medical school professor for close to four decades, I thought we had all the bases covered, but that is not the case. There is a huge gap in terms of treating environmental related chronic illnesses. The acute illnesses are covered in the emergency depart uh, medicine departments, but chronic illnesses are, are, seem to escape the attention of allopathic physicians and allopathic education, which is, I think, has to change. So you mentioned Alzheimer's being one of the most common diseases that's associated with environmental toxins. What kind of things are these integrated medicine physicians testing for that escape allopathic physicians? Well, one, one toxins that can be tested in individual are the metal toxins. Now, testing for metal toxins is not simply drawing uh, blood levels and ascertaining it that way, because many of the metal toxins quickly leave the bloodstream. They stay a little longer in the urine, but they leave that too. So it, to actually screen for metal toxins, you also need to check male or hair samples for metal toxins. Where would a typical patient be exposed to these toxins? Is it where their house is located? Is it in the water, the food they eat? Where typically does one get exposed to these environmental toxins? Okay, That's, that is a very good question because it's all of the above. You can, you can breathe in uh, particulate matter 2.5, which has definitely been shown to be associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's. You can consume arsenic in drinking water. I re recently, uh, with some research collaborators, completed a study, a clinical study of people with cognitive impairment, and the finding of metal toxicity was not uncommon. You can uh, also get it in food. There are many, for example, cold cereals that have contained glyphosate, a, a substance which ha has properties that are likely to be neurotoxic. So consuming organic foods instead of regular fruits and vegetables is, is one step in that direction. But it's far from the only, because we have all these organochemicals in the environment, so-called endocrine disruptors, uh, that are unfortunately ubiquitous. In, in personal care products and uh, other products as well. And also maybe in, in the water supply as well. To check on your local water supply, I, I recommend consumers look at the uh, data from the environmental work. Now, if I'm a physician and I see a chronic disease that I suspect it's from an environmental toxin, are these effects reversible by simply reducing the exposure for the toxin? Can we help cure some of these chronic diseases that we see? It is uh, at least theoretically possible. And also, now there does need to be a great deal more research in this area. But I'll give you an example. And in, in, individuals, particularly females, are predisposed to develop copper toxicity if they also are taking contraceptive pills. You, you can check for serum copper levels, and when found elevated, the the treatment is fairly simple and straightforward and does not require chelation therapy. So the treatment involves taking some zinc 
So it's uh, relatively uh, straightforward in that regard. Talk about from a patient perspective, what, what are patients to do? So you mentioned going to an integrative medicine physician where they can be tested for a variety of environmental toxins as one option. Are there any signs that they should be looking for that would cause them to take that next step and be screened for environmental toxins? I think they have to consult with their personal physicians as well. It's, the field is not at all clarified. As I, as I uh, point out in the book, there are shortcomings in terms of clinical research within integrative medicine, but, they're, uh, but at least they're trying to address the problem. For some reason, allopathic medicine has sort of turn the other way with this regard. For example, many of the issues that, the, that are, need to be addressed are, are, are studied uh, in schools of public health and public health professors of environmental health are knowledgeable in this, but they don't treat individuals. So it, it has sort of uh, evolved to where that's why I had to, I had to mention integrative medicine in the book. I didn't start out to do that, but it, it sort of evolved that way. Now, what are some of the reasons why you think allopathic medicine has turned a proverbial blind eye to environmental toxins? Well, I think in the pursuit of evidence-based medicine, clinical research has become too much under the control of for-profit corporate pharmaceutical companies that really have no interest in pursuing this part at all. They're chemical companies. Mm -hmm. So they're part of the chemical industry that ha is part of the problem to begin with. Uh, you know, for example, you can find within allopathic medical schools research in departments of pharmacology pertaining to environmental toxins, but you can't find a clinical counterpart to that with regard to chronic exposures. I mean, a little bit in, in industrial medicine. In the chapter that, I, that, that appears on Kevin MD, a portion of chapter two in my book appears on Kevin MD, and it describes in particular mercury toxicity. It was Paracelsus who was a 15th century physician first called attention to mercury toxicity. And his fellow physicians did not greet this news at all uh, positively. And they, but nevertheless, he was on to something that was important. He was a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. and he already was thinking of this. He was an Austrian physician. He also wrote the first treatise on occupational medicine. But I think it has not captured any of the established divisions of within allopathic academic medicine. So it hasn't really been covered sufficiently. So there are a number of chronic illnesses that are falling in between and require more research. So I, 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 there, the one, I think there is a bright spot in that the NIH has now founded a national center for complementary and integrative health. So they're starting to fund some of the research in this area, but their budget is quite small compared to the rest of the NIH. And I do, do hope to see that continue to grow so that they can study things that are not going to have a big financial return. So far, the pharmaceutical companies are not going to be interested in studying, but which may be very effective, may have low, low toxicity and be useful to a wide uh, swath of patients that are currently not being served. We're talking to Arnold Iser. He's an internal medicine physician, and he's the author of the book, Preserving Brain Health in a Toxic Age, New Insights from Neuroscience, Integrative Medicine, and Public Health. Arnold, where do you see the future regarding that intersection between allopathic medicine and environmental toxins? Do you see this remaining in the realm of integrative medicine, or do you see a better adoption and acceptance of environmental toxins within allopathic realm? Well, I hope it's the latter. 
I have an article, The Growth of Neurotoxins Related to Climate Change, in the website, The Conversation. And it, when people read it, they say, it's quite frightening. And it is, because the forest fires are contributing a severe increase in particulate matter, which is neurotoxic. The flooding that's occurring from worsening hurricanes and the like, damaged buildings cause the mold toxicity in those buildings. And the, the excessive use of uh, fertilizer causes the phosphate runoff to cause the large blooms of blue-green algae, which is clearly neurotoxic. And uh, one state that's taken a lead on this is actually Ohio. And they have encouraged their farmers not to fertilize when it's going to rain or when the ground is saturated. And the, the reason they're dealing with it is their water supplies are already being threatened by these growth of the blue-green algae. So I think it's becoming an increasing national health crisis issue. So I do think allopathic medicine is going to come around to dealing with this. It's, it's too important not to. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? I, I think the uh, physician audience needs to be more aware of environmental toxins, how they might manifest in clinical illness. Uh, certainly, the book is, is, is a reasonable starting point. I have, in addition to the, the science in the book, and I have over 400 references, I also put in vignettes of the researchers because I think it, it's important to gain insight from the people who did uh, challenge the conventional wisdom and did develop the, the insights all, all the way from the founder of neuroscience, Ramon Cajal, to researchers currently doing research in this area. So I do, I do think there's room for improvement, but I think a large number of physicians have to become aware of this and to be proactive and demand more from their medical societies Arnold, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. My pleasure, Kevin. Thank you.